Just kind of play that. Make you, make you feel a whole lot better, but as they're playing, as they're playing, I'm looking down in my water cup. And, and every time Sister Ellen hits that bass, time she hits that bass there's a vibration in the water and it starts it starts from the inside and it exerts outward there's a rhythm and then there's an effect there's a touch and then there's effect there's a touch and there's an effect you know that's exactly what it's supposed to be like when we get saved it doesn't start from the outside in when you surrender to Jesus Christ and you give your life truly over to the Lord and you say, you know what, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. And his Holy Spirit is deposited on the inside. There's now, because of what takes place on the inside, there's an outward movement. There's an outward movement. And if you're here today and you don't feel, you don't feel like there's any outward movement in your life, I want to encourage you go back to focusing on the touch maybe you've gotten away from your study time with God maybe you've gotten away from intimacy and worship and praise with the Father go back to what causes the outward effect the touch on the inside that's all that matters let's pray father you make the difference you make the difference the Bible is really clear that all roads do not lead to you. Jesus himself says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You, Father, you make all the difference. God, I pray today we would experience your faithfulness in our lives. God, I pray in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ that I myself would not be seen nor heard today. God, my heart's desire is that you alone would be heard and seen, living and speaking and breathing through my life. I confess to you, Father, and to these people that I am no good without you. I've got nothing worth saying if it were not for your truth. God, I pray in the name and the blood of Jesus and rebuke every enemy from trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that everyone that came through those doors with burdens would leave here without them. That every person that came in feeling heavy would leave here lighthearted. That every person that came through those doors with a hardened heart would leave here with a softened one, a heart of flesh, that you would, you would replace their heart. God, I pray that every person with ears that cannot hear, that today they'd be able to hear and receive your truth, that they would have eyes to see your truth, and that they would understand just what you have for them. So, Father, have your way. We want your will. We accept your will. Your will be done, not ours. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said, Let's give God a clap of praise. He's so good. <clears throat> if, if you do not have a good study Bible, see myself or one of the brothers at the door before you leave. We want to give you one. No strings attached. No card to fill out or anything. We just want to give you God's word. It'll change your life forever. Amen. Um, Matthew 26. Let's get going. Um, if you do not have a Bible in your hands, the scripture will be on the screen in just a moment. Matthew 26, beginning with the 36th verse.
How many people know because of your walk with the Lord that God is faithful? Amen. God is so faithful. Matthew 26, 36, and the word of our Lord God says this. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I want you to look for a moment at the 41st verse. I hadn't planned on saying this, but I feel led in the Spirit to do it right now. If you're going through something and you feel like you just can't kick it, you feel like you just can't shake the sin, if you feel like, you know, I just don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through, look at verse 41. Watch and what? Pray. Everybody say watch and pray. If you're taking notes, write those, two, write, write those two words down. Watch, pray. Okay. Watch, pray. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Here it is. The spirit, lowercase s, your spirit. The spirit indeed is willing, but our flesh is what? Weak. Today we're going to take a look at being tired Anybody been spiritually, emotionally, mentally tired before? We're going to take a look at being tired, and we're also going to take a look, church, at how the enemy can move in in that moment of being tired and try to work in our lives and catch us off guard. As we read the scriptures together today, I want you to do this. I want you to consider as we read the scripture how to apply it to your own personal life right now. Right now. I want you to leave here today. By the strength of God working in you, by his Holy Spirit working in you, I want you to leave here today to taking this scripture and seeing and knowing how you can apply it in your life right now. So let's look at it. Matthew 26, 36. Let's read a few verses, and then we're going to swing back around and talk about it. Matthew 26, 36. Look at it. Then Jesus went with him to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Now he knows that his time has come to begin that season of his ministry where he's going to the cross for every one of you in this room, myself included. He says in verse 38, my soul is very sorrowful, even to to death. Remain here. And watch with me. So there's their command. Verse 39. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is, 
If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, Jesus, he's, he's at a garden and he's praying. This garden, we know in scripture that Jesus loved to visit multiple times throughout his ministry here on earth. Jot this down, John 18, 2. John chapter 18 and the second verse. That verse, John 18, 2, speaks of this garden in Jesus, and it tells us that Jesus often met in this garden with his disciples. Write this down, uh, the word Gethsemane. This is the garden where Jesus is, Gethsemane. You, you want to know what that means? It's beautiful. So write that name and then put equals. And here's what Gethsemane means. Listen to this. Oil press. Everybody say oil press. In the moment when Jesus is praying in one of his toughest hours in ministry, he goes to a garden that's called oil press. Oil press. Let me explain that for a moment. The oil press applied extreme pressure in order to remove the best oil. Everybody say the best oil. If you wanted the best oil from an olive, you had to give it the most intense of pressure. The heavier the pressure, the better the oil. Listen to that. The heavier the pressure, the better the oil. Here, here we have Jesus in the garden. And verse 37, uh, Jesus began to be sorrowful and troubled. But then if you look at verse 38, it tells us that Jesus was so sorrowful, even to the point of death. We don't, well, let me just say this. We know he, we know he didn't like the extreme pressure he was facing. And let me, just, let me just make this little disclaimer here. Jesus wasn't scared of dying. How many people know that? That wasn't the issue. When Jesus was sorrowful, it wasn't because he knew he was going to the cross to die. I mean, look, if Jesus wanted to, I mean, come on. He's God. You want to know why Jesus was sorrowful unto the point of death? Because he knew that in just a short while on that cross... He was going to bear your sin and my sin and every sin, the weight of all sin of the world. And you know why he was sorrowful? Because when Jesus accepted our sin, God the Father turned away from God the Son. God had to turn away from the Son because God is holy. And at that moment when Jesus wore sin like a cloth, the sin of the world, he and God in that moment, God turns. That's why he was sorrowful. He wasn't sorrowful that he paid the price for you. He wasn't sorrowful that he had to die on the cross. He wasn't, listen, he de everybody say he defeated death. He defeated death. See, I, I'm a competitor. I know there's other competitors in this room. I ain't never felt sorry about winning nothing. <laughs> there's been times where people have told me, hey, take the pressure off, man. This don't look good. No, no, no. We don't ever give the enemy a chance to come back and win. Well, you never take off the pressure. You know? uh, one, one time, um, one of our, uh, Elijah, he was, uh, this has been many years ago, he was at a karate tournament back when he was doing his karate thing, and he had this kid on the mat. And it was kind of like a movie, you know, I'm off to the side and literally I said, finish him. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the guy who's in charge of everything walks over to me, you know, trying to be polite because there's other parents there, I guess, you know. And <laughs> he says, uh, hey, you can't, you can't say that. I said, I want the boy to win. I'm the one paying for these lessons and we ain't going to teach him how to lose nothing. And he says, yeah, 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 but, you know, when they're down, you've got to give them a chance to get back up. And I said, well, what dojo teaches that? <laughs> you don't ever give your enemy a chance to stand back up. Here, let me help you so you can come punch me in the face in a moment. <laughs> and I looked at the guy and I said, no, 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 that makes no sense at all. I said, 
Why take it to another, to another round? Why take it to another match? If he breaks the kid now, the kid doesn't get back up. My son wins. Simple. So it wasn't that Jesus was scared of losing because he didn't lose anything. He gained everything. The fact was that he knew that when he wore your sin and my sin, God turned. And in that moment, he knew that he was separated from his father. And so he knows that moment is coming. Now, the scripture says that Jesus and God have been together from the beginning. And nothing was made that was made without Jesus there to make it. And in this moment, it would have been the very first time that God turns away from the Son. And so he's sorrowful unto the point of death. How does that affect you and me today? Let's go there for a moment, shall we? Have you ever been sorry about your sin? The easy answer is what? Yes. But have you been so sorrowful about it that it brings you to tears? Have, have you been so sorrowful about it that it brings you to such a repentance? Sorrowful unto death. In your repentance, have you understood that when we sin, the job of the sin in our life is trying to separate us and divide us from the love of our Father? It's a big deal. And listen, especially it's a big deal when we go into a situation willingly ready to sin. It's a really big deal. And so here we have Jesus. The scripture says that he's sorrowful even unto death. Even though the pressure was great, greater than we could understand, he still went to the cross in obedience. Question for you today. Write this down. Write this down. We're talk listen, we're, we're talking about uh, Jesus in the garden that's known as the press. Write this down. What's my press? What's pressing me right now? What in my life right now is my press? What kind of press has God allowed to be in my life right now? And, and Will I allow the pressing in my life to bring about the absolute best of me? See, because here's the deal. The press is even going to bring out the bad or the press is going to bring out the real good. It's either going to bring out the bad, the ugly, or it's going to bring out the best of the oil. Here's the thing about the olive press. The process of getting the best oil from the olive involved different stages. And some of you are going through things in life and you feel like you've been in this and in this forever. But what you've got to understand is sometimes to get the best out of you, you've got to go through stages. Why? Because in flesh, how many of you like me can be hard-headed? What I've experienced about God in the life of ministry is that God doesn't just take us from here to the outcome because we miss too much between the beginning and the end. And so write this down if you're taking notes. God trains in stages. God trains in stages. God trains in stages. Here's the thing. If I'm going to say that each stage takes time, then my faith has to be patient. I'm going to say that again. If you can say that each stage takes time, then your faith has to be patient. What we cannot do is give up just because it seems hard. Amen? What, what we cannot do is quit just because you're tired of being the only one in your family living for God. What we cannot do is, is stop pressing in simply because we feel the pressure. Write this down if you're taking notes. The pressure has purpose. The pressure has purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, pressure makes you stronger. Pressure makes you stronger. When it's God applying it, there's a purpose to it, and the pressure makes you stronger. Listen to me, church. The pressure doesn't have to break you. 
The pressure does not have to break you. Now it will, it will, and it can if you let it. But the pressure does not have to break you. Actually, quite opposite, it can make you stronger as long as you look to God the Father for the strength of his Holy Spirit to get you through it. Look at Matthew 26, verse 39. Go there with me. Matthew 26, 39. Look at what it says next. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as what, church? You will. Write this down if you're taking notes. Um, Where's my garden? Do you, do you have a garden that you can go to? A quiet place. A quiet place. I think, it's, I think it's really purposeful that we understand that Jesus had a quiet place. And if Jesus had a quiet place, how much more should we consider one as well? Your quiet place, your quiet place. See, a lot of people, let me just teach you this. And I'm not throwing off on anybody. I'm really not. A lot of people say their quiet place is their car. That's not good enough. Because the last time I checked, most people in this room cannot drive while keeping their eyes closed. I'm not saying that you have to close your eyes to pray. But what I am saying is this. When you do pray, please consider giving God all your attention. And so, yes, we pray without ceasing, and we should go throughout our day, and we can be at work, and we can be praying, and, and we don't have to close our eyes. That's always having communication with God. But if you don't have a place where you can sit down and worry about nothing else than hearing the voice of God, you're missing it. Matter of fact, most people that don't elevate from glory to glory, the reason, the big reason is, is because they don't have a quiet place where their relationship can be nurtured by the Holy Spirit. The reason most people haven't learned to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit working within you is because you haven't created the environment to receive Him as such. So, what's your garden place? Mine is the shower. I've shared that with you many times. My garden is the shower. You know, nobody, nobody bothers me in the shower. Uh, my wife wants nothing to do with me in there. And the children, ah, you know, just they don't want to see dad in there. And I'm okay with all of those because I'm telling you, God speaks to me in amazing ways in the shower. So much of what you see in here came from my garden in the shower. The screens here, I came to Bob years ago and I said, Bob, God showed me something in the shower. And I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm going to trust you to do it. And there it is. And all that came from my garden in the shower. When you create a place with expectation to hear from God, God loves speaking. And let me tell you why God loves to speak to the heart of his people. Because it increases your faith and it grows you closer to him. And the more you hear in your heart from God, the more you tend to listen to God. The more you hear from God, trust me, your faith will increase and the more you'll want to listen to God. Look at it again, Matthew 26, 39. Watch this. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came, verse 40, and he came to the disciples and found them, what church? And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Surely, surely not one of the disciples' finer moments. Would you agree with me, church? They'd, they'd fallen asleep. The, the mission to stay there and watch was made very clear by Jesus, the Messiah, but, but they failed to do so. We've all been there, every one of us, myself included. We, we've all been there before for whatever reason. God places something on our hearts to do. He gives us something to say. He gives us something to share. He gives us a mission, a vision, a goal, and we just weren't as excited about it as God was. Anybody ever had that moment with God? God tells you to do something and you're just not as excited about it as he is? I really don't want to talk to that person. I don't want to pick that phone up. 
I don't want to answer that call. I don't want to open that letter. I don't want to see them today because then I've got to deal with them today and there's an issue that we have together. I don't want to mess with those people. And so God gives you a mission and it has a few ways it can go. You're either not going to do it, you'll be half-hearted about it, or you'll do it and just not serve passionately while doing it. Or you can be all in. You can be all in and do whatever he's asked you to do. Here the disciples have not so much taken it, at least serious enough to remain awake. And Jesus, after leaving the majority of them at the beginning of the garden, enters into the garden, stops looking at Peter and a couple others and says, now you wait here, watch and stay awake, and I'm going to talk to my father. Jesus goes and speaks with the father, and on his way back, he sees the few that he left a little deeper into the garden asleep, not watching. Write this down, write this down. Don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. You know, you can stay awake for whatever you're excited about. Can you say amen to that? You can, you can stay awake for whatever you're excited about. How many of you remember when you were little going to a sleepover and you and your friends were just going to try to make it till midnight? Anybody ever been there before? It's like, woo, we're going to do it. You, you set that goal. You set that goal. How many people can remember trying to make it to New Year's Eve? Right? You set that goal. You set that goal. And then when you get older, I don't know, like 41, and you get tired and you don't care about making it to New Year's Eve and you're fine with going to bed at 9 o'clock now. I saw this thing before I came to church this morning. It said, um, the, the, the th <laughs> it said going to bed early, staying at home all the time, being in the co confounds of your own room. The things that used to be punishment now are our goals. My parents might go to your room. Oh, man. Today I look at my wife. I'm like, can I go to my room? Please? Send me to my quiet place. Let me get in the shower. Jesus, Jesus comes back and he, he, sees, he sees a handful of the, a few of the disciples anyway. He, he sees them sleeping there where he left them. We've been there. So many things can distract us from our mission. I'm going to say a quote from A.W. Tozer, and I want you to pay attention to this. The disciples fell asleep. Yeah, the reason they're tired. But the truth is that we've all fallen asleep on our call before of whatever it is God's called us to do. And we just didn't act on it. And in today's society, one of the biggest reasons we don't act on what God has called us to do is because we're just too busy. We've got too much stuff. We have too many opportunities, and in the, in the abundance of opportunities, we're missing the one opportunity we should be grasping hold of the most. So listen to what A.W. Tozer said about it, and this was back when he was living a long time ago. A.W. Tozer said this, and I quote, Our problem is that we go from toy to toy rather than from glory to glory, unquote. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with enjoying life. But if your enjoyment gets you off of focus of serving God in life, then there's something wrong with that. Amen? I'm going to say it again. Our problem is that we go from toy to toy rather than from glory to glory. Oh, how true that is. Let me also say this. We need to be watching more than just what's happening in the physical realm. And a lot of Christians, they'll, a, lot, a lot of people, they'll get saved, they become a Christian, and then they only learn to be tuned in to the physical radar, that which they see and they hear. But how many of you know that there's another level beyond the physical side? And it's the spirit realm. Everybody say spirit realm. All right. And this, listen, this should be encouraging everyone in the room. If you're not already tuned in, you need to be. How do you get tuned in to what's happening in the Spirit? By asking God to give you wisdom by His Holy Spirit. Lord, teach me what I can't see. Show me what I can't see. Teach me what I can't understand. Help me hear what's not coming across audibly. Help me hear. The Bible says, the Bible speaks of an inner ear, a spiritual ear. The Holy Spirit tunes in 
that spiritual ear. See, you can hear something on the inside that no one else hears on the outside. Teach me, Lord, to be tuned in to what your Holy Spirit is leading me to do, prompting me to do, guiding me to go. May I be tuned in with your power, not my own. So if you're here today and it's not currently in your prayer practice to say, Father, teach me by your Holy Spirit. Help me, help me hear your Holy Spirit today. My, may I be in tune to what your Holy Spirit calls me to today. Help me rely on the power of your Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're saved, you already got them in there. Let them out the closet. Let them go to work in your life. Open the door. By all means, let the Holy Spirit do for you what the Holy Spirit was made to do. He's your counselor. He's your encourager. He's your guide. He's your strength. He's everything. He's everything. I mean, it would be like, it would be like going to play a football game with no gear. That'd be crazy. You'd have the gear. Go ahead and put it on so you can fully operate on the field the way that you're supposed to. What we cannot do, what we should not ever do, is have the power of God's Spirit in us and all availability to be able to hear from Him, and we don't. That's like stepping onto that field, church, without any equipment. Oh, we're losing so much. We're losing so much. Oftentimes, you want to know why Christians burn out? Christians burn out because they're trying to do it on their own. And they've got good intentions. They really have good intentions. But see, your strength does have a limitation. Write that down if you're taking notes. My strength has limitations. How many of you got mad with the person you came to church with? No, I'm just playing. Don't actually raise your hand on that. But Watch this. Your peace has limitations too. Your love has limitations, doesn't it? Your love has limitations. Everything about us has limitations. And this is why we need to call on the power, the working, everybody say working power. This is why we need to call on the working power of the Holy Spirit because he's everything that we need, man. He's, he doesn't have limitations. He doesn't have limitations. So when I need peace with my wife and my wife needs peace with me, the best peace that we're ever going to get for one another is by the Holy Spirit saying, calm down, boo-boo. I know Lee really just messed up right there, but he don't need you to say it. Here's why. Because the same Holy Spirit in her is also in me. And he will convict me. See, we would do far better off as, as spouses if we didn't go around pointing at each other all the time. Let the Holy Spirit do a work. See, oftentimes in marriages, not to say that we can't correct each other, but hear what I'm saying on this. Oftentimes in marriages, we never give our spouse enough time to be corrected by the Holy Spirit because we're playing the game of the Holy Spirit. And we, and we try to rebuke our spouse in their wrongdoing. And the whole time, you know what's going to happen when you rebuke your spouse in their wrongdoing and you don't give God time to do it? You're going to anger them in the flesh because you're trying to interrupt what the Spirit's trying to do. You're trying to outrun the Spirit. You're trying to outwork the Spirit. Listen, if you do anything, pray to God that the Holy Spirit convict your spouse and say, God, you handle the man. God, you handle the woman. You made her. You deal with her. <laughs> Write this down if you're taking notes. Give it to God. Now, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect, but Sister Stephanie, our secretary here, can attest to you. There has been a handful of times over the years that she has been up here where I said, she said, how are you going to handle that? And I said, I'm just going to give it to God. And Sister Steph, hasn't God showed up mightily in that? He said, I'm just going to give it to God. I'm just going to give it to God. Because if I put my mouth in the way of it, I'm going to hurt feelings. And if I put my foot in the way of it, my foot might get stepped on too. And then my feelings get hurt. And I might say something that could be totally right, but spoken totally wrong. Spoken totally wrong. And so I just say, God, I'm going to continue to pray until I know you've dealt with it. And listen to me, that takes faith. But if you're willing to trust God to speak to his own people, he will. He will. What that also takes is not just faith, a constant pressing into God. God, will you do this for me? God, will you do this for me? God, will you do this for me? The same Holy Spirit that's in me, will you speak? to your daughter, to your son who's over there that's also in them. God, will you do this for me? Pressing, pressing, pressing until you get the best result. 
the best result. It takes, jot this down, it takes time spent in the garden. It takes time spent in the garden. It takes faith and it takes time spent in the garden. Look at Matthew 26, 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you, could you not watch with me one hour? Look at your neighbor and say, stay awake. You know, what's so, you know what's so sad about the disciples falling to sleep? You know what's so sad? Peter, that was going to be the rock of the church. You know, you know, you know what's so sad about this, this current state of Peter and the boys, the fellas? Um, Peter and the disciples said that they would be faithful unto death, didn't they? Oh, we'll be faithful. We'll be faithful unto death. We'll never leave you, Lord. We'll never forsake you, Lord. They'll have to come through us first. It's pretty easy to come over a man who's sleeping. I mean, look at how the extremes fall in the life of Peter. And we're the same too, aren't we? We can leave church and be so fired up. And then two days later, two hours later, look at Matthew 24, verse 3 for a moment. Go backwards. Go back a couple, couple chapters. Matthew 24, verse 3. Look at what takes place right here. It's so neat what's happening. Matthew 24, 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all the nations, for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. I'll tell you what, let's get... Let's get verse 13 on the screen. We're going to read this out loud together. Ready, church? One, two, three, go. Stop. But the who? Can I tell y'all who that's talking about? No, it's talking about me. Yes. Because I'm possessive over that verse. So Sister Christie could say, oh, pastor, it's talking about me too. Me. Me. See, watch this. Us can't get me into heaven. We can't get me into heaven. You know whose responsibility that is. See, let me teach you something if you don't know this already. Satan doesn't like a Christian who takes things personal. You ever see somebody in life say, man, they take things too personal. They just need to not care as much. Satan don't like it when you care about your position in faith. Satan doesn't like it when you care about following the gospel truth. So let's get that, let's get that up there. Everybody say it's talking about me. All right. At the beginning on the count of three, one, two, three, go. But the stop right there. What do you have to do? Look at your neighbor and say, that's hard. that's hard. Listen, if anybody signed you up to be a Christian and they said it was going to be easy, they lied to you. They lied to you. Take it from somebody that knows they lied to you. It's hard. It, uh, Jesus even warns us that Satan is coming to steal from you, trying to kill you, 
and trying to destroy you. Does anything sound easy about that? I mean, think about it. If you got a phone call saying, hey, lock the doors, get your guns loaded, so-and-so's coming over to take you out, you wouldn't just, like, take a nap, would you? But when it comes to the spiritual things, we tend not to take them as serious as we should. Look at it up there again. But the one who, what? Endures to win. Tell your neighbor, don't give up. See, this just ain't no sign up and don't come back to the field. But we'll still give you the trophy when the season's over. Our youngest, our youngest, what was that sport he signed up to play? It was flag football this past season. Our youngest signed up for flag football. He went to a couple games. And then other things started coming up that they chose to do, quite frankly, just to be honest with you. He chose to do other things. And you may say, well, that's so unfair, you know, as the dad, you should have took him. No, I didn't want to take him. <laughs> so when he says, I don't want to go, I applaud that and say, thank you for being honest. It saves me from having to drive 40 minutes down the street. It saves my gas money, saves my time, and we could all do something we all really want to do today. And so he didn't want to go. Because he had about three weeks of events that he chose to go to instead. Well, that left two weeks left of football season. And he looked at me one morning and said, we going to football today? And I said, oh, no. He said, well, why not? I said, do you know how embarrassing that is? We haven't been there in almost a month, and now you want to go show up with the team? He says, well, what about my trophy? I said, I ain't no trophy. <laughs> you don't get that. The trophy is for the people that showed up and did something about it. Because he, he, he had this stage in life where he was just signing up for sports to get the trophies because his brother, his brother was so athletic, his brother had trophies all over the place, and he thought in order to be successful in life, you had to have trophies hanging up or, or sitting up on the bookshelf. So he said, well, what am I going to do about my trophy? I said, we ain't going down there to get no trophy. Well, do you think they could mail it? No, we're, no, 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 we're not even asking for it. <laughs> there, there are Christians who think all we have to do is sign up and participate every once in a while, and they're still expecting to get a crown in heaven. And I'm just going to tell you, that's not how God works. That's not how God works. It says that you have to endure. That means make it to the what? End. That means make it to the end. Now, let's get that back up there. We're going to read it together from the beginning. One, two, three, go. But the... The one who makes it to the end will be saved. The end means this, whether it's the return of Christ through that eastern sky in the rapture, or whether it's when he calls us home through death on this earth. Whatever your end looks like, but if you remain faithful to the end, the Bible says you what? Will be saved. And so I encourage you just as many hands were raised, mine included, when I asked you when we first began this morning, how many of you have been tired before? I want to encourage you, press through. Press through. I mean, what an example that Jesus gives us as far as pressing through. Father, I don't want to go through this, but your will be done. If this cup can be removed, remove it, but your will be done done. Hmm. Here's the deal about taking possession of the verse. One thing I hope that the devil knows about me, I'm not quitting on my Lord. And I'm not quitting on you either. I hope that the devil knows about me that I pray in the name of my Lord. I hope that the devil knows about me that I have faith that God can do what God says through his word he can do. I hope the devil knows about me that I've got one wife and I'm happy with her. Amen. I hope he knows it. I hope he knows it. I hope the devil knows that I like kicking his teeth in every chance I get. I want the devil, 
I want the devil to be concerned and scared to pieces when he hears the name Christ Family Outreach Church because in unity we gather in prayer and believe that God can do what God says he can do. So write this down if you're taking notes. What does the devil know about me? What does the devil know about, let's just say, Susie or Ed or Renee or Jim or Eric or Erica or Stephanie or Cana or Elijah or Jim or Sharon? What does the devil know about you? What does he know? See, let me tell you this. When we operate with the power of God's Holy Spirit, then the devil gets afraid of us. When we operate in our own power, he ain't got much to worry about. He ain't got much to worry about. I remember when Erica and I first started dating, and we would go to theme parks or things like this, you know, and there would be just me and her on a date, and then there would be a group of fellas that roll up. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, I hope they don't, you know, we were, we were younger, you know, and, and, and it would be a young crowd that rolled up, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, I hope none of them be looking at my woman because I'm, I'm not going to like that. <laughs> but it's one of me and like seven of them that do that math, you know. Um, and then there will be times, God bless her, she would say something to them. And I'm like, Erica, don't do that. So many times in our marriage, she's been so bold, bolder than me, because she ain't the one that got to do the fighting. And I say, <laughs> Erica, you can't talk like that. We can't talk to those people like that. Let's just keep moving. Well, I don't like how they're doing that. No, 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 no. No. <laughs> Please, I'm the one that's got to get beat up here by seven other guys. <laughs> but what I've learned in spiritual matters is that as a Christian, I don't have to fear anything. How many of you guys know that in your life? You don't, you, don't, you don't have to fear anything. Everybody say it's God's fight. Listen, that's not cocky. That's faithful. That's, that's having faith. That's being faithful to having faith. That, that, that is knowing who your God is. Amen? Hmm. Now, here's the deal. In the process of the devil knowing who you are and what you're about, we've got to be sure that we don't fall asleep. We've got to be careful not to lose focus. If you're taking notes, write that down. Um, don't lose focus. Don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. Don't lose focus. We've got to make sure that we're obedient to the call, no matter how hard the press in the garden. We've got to make sure that we're obedient to the call, no matter how hard the press is in the garden. Look at Matthew 26:41. Let's go further in this. Matthew 26, verse 41. Look at what happens next. Jesus says, what? Watch and pray. That's the command. Verse 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into what? Temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, I want you to look at the first part of verse 41. Watch and pray, Jesus says. Watch and pray, that you may not enter into what church? Now, I'm going to promise you something because the word just teaches us. It, it just taught us that. It teaches us this. I promise you, according to the word of God, that as Christians, listen to me, as Christians, if we did more watching and more praying, we would do less sinning. Now, hear that. I'm going to say that again. If you and I would do more watching and more praying, then you and I would do less sinning. Anybody agree with me on that one? If we watched more, if we prayed more, we'd sin less. Somebody may be sitting out there today thinking, why is he always talking about not sinning? Because that's what God's called us not to do. And sin is a really big deal. Because the Bible says after it has been fully conceived, sin leads to death. And the last thing we want is to get so caught up in our old prior sin nature that we begin to lose our daily relationship with our Heavenly Father. 
But see, that's how the devil works. He'll get a Christian so wrapped up in his old self and his old sin that that Christian feels so guilty that they won't read as much as they used to read. They won't pray as much as they used to pray. Go to John 14, verse 1. Watch this. John 14, verse 1. Look at what happens right here. John 14, verse 1. John 14, 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Jesus says, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Let's stop right there for a moment. Uh, One thing to remember to help you keep on track, to help help keep you from falling asleep on the mission, is, is when you daily remind yourself that Jesus is coming back that Jesus is coming back. It makes it a lot easier to focus on the glory to glory moment rather than the toy to toy moment when I know at any moment Jesus could come back to take me home. I can remember times when I was young where my dad would give me something to do. Like on a Saturday, he'd be off and he'd give myself and my brother a mission. He'd give us something to do. And you know what made us do it was when he would say, I'm going to come back and check on that. And the reason we did it was because we knew, we knew that dad was going to come back and check on it. And if we didn't do what dad asked us to do, there was going to be a punishment involved. Amen? And I think that Christians don't take seriously the fact that Jesus said he's coming back. Yeah, you know, we know he said it. And you know, we know it's going to come one day. You know, we, we, we know all that. But do we take it serious? Do we take it serious? That at any moment, it could take place. At any moment, it could take place. Look at the verse that takes place next. Watch what happens. Go with me. Uh, Look at verse 5, John 14, verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am, say it with me, church, the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There was a boy. There was a boy on an airplane and he was too young to fly by himself. And the little boy was looking out of the window of the plane on a rather long, lengthy flight. Because the boy was too young to travel without any family, uh, he, was, he was assigned someone to fly with him through the airlines. His parents paid for that, for that additional service. Some time in the flight goes on and this, this person who's supposed to be watching over the young child is just trying to make small talk with the little boy. And in the small talk, the person assigned to watch the boy leans over very gently to this young fella looking out of the window and, this, and she says, are you tired of this long flight? And the boy looked at the lady and said, eh, I'm a little tired, but I don't mind it much. You see, when I get to that airport, my father is going to meet me there. I think we would do ourselves a huge favor if every day we woke up we remembered that this could be the day that our father welcomes us home. It's serious business. It's serious business. Um, r- write, write this down. Uh, write this down. Some of us need to clean house. Can I, can, I, can I just share a little bit with you guys? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and she knows this. When, when <laughs> come back over here. When, when the wife says, hey, I'm on my way home, she's been gone all day working, the last thing you want to hear as a man is, what have you been doing all day? And so I'm going to teach you a few tricks in the bag. 
You know, as you know she's on the way, that'd be a real good time, fellas, to start getting the sink empty. Put it in the dishwasher and start it. So that when she gets home, it gives her a little peace hearing that you've done something. Now, it used to work really well until one day she figured out, you just wait till last minute to do that. But at least the sink's empty. Another little tip. I got a lot of them. <laughs> it would really go a long way if you went to the hamper and you took the hamper and you actually put it in the washing machine and then the load that you wash, you actually do something called transfer it to the dryer. And then while that's drying, you could go empty the rest of the hamper, put it in the washer, and when that expires to be transferred over, you actually take what's in the dryer and you fold it and you do what they call put it away. Just a little something. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take very long. And then if you want to get really good, if you want to get really good, you can actually turn the vacuum on. You don't even have to run it. Just let it start smelling up in the house. Just enough so that as she's caught on to your old games, now she's got a battle in her mind. Wait a minute, did he really do that? And then one, one good brother in the Lord, and I'm going to explain why I'm telling, I know it's all funny, but I'm explaining why I'm telling this spiritually in a moment. And then another good brother in the Lord told me one time, he said, well, I got one better than that. And I said, what is that? He said, right before she walks in, when she just pulls up, you see the headlights come on down the driveway. He said, I'm going to teach you this. Go on and get your rag, get it wet, and wipe down the counters. Then you take that rag and you slap it on your forehead to make it look like you've been sweating. <laughs> and when she comes in, you're leaning over that wet, clean, shining counter, and you're just wiping your brow. Whew. And you look at her and you say, what'd you do today, honey? Let me explain that spiritually for a moment. It's possible. Give me a minute. <laughs> We're willing to clean something up when we know family's coming over, aren't we? We could live like mess for days and weeks and months. But when family comes over, all of a sudden, the cry in the house is to start cleaning things that you ain't cleaned in years. <laughs> Who cares? But the reason we clean is because someone that we value is coming over. I'm just going to say this plain and simple. It's the only way I know how to do it. If we valued God the way that we should, we'd keep our spiritual homes a lot cleaner than we do. If we knew that at any moment he could call me home, I want to bring to him a clean house. Write that down if you're taking notes. Clean house. Everybody say clean house. I, I want if it's if it's as important for me to clean the house when my wife comes home how much more important should it be for me to clean my spiritual house when my father calls me home why why do we put up with mess in our heart why do we put up with dirt and filth in our mind but on the outside, we try to clean everything because mom or dad or wife, husband, spouse is coming home. Why? Oftentimes, oftentimes, watch this, we get more concerned with the dirt on the outside than we're concerned with the filth on the inside. And we quickly, if we're not careful, what we do not want to do is just simply look like a whitewashed tomb. Someone who says one thing believes one thing, and lives one thing. It's the stuff on the inside that's got to be cleaned out first. See, I didn't even plan on looking at that water cup when Sister Ellen was playing that bass and swinging it around her neck and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> just playing. But when I said the comment just now, it's the stuff on the inside that matters, it took me right back to watching that cup and the difference happened on the inside. The difference happens on the inside. What good is it if your house that you live in is clean on the outside but filthy on the inside? What difference does that make? Okay, so you got a clean house on the outside, 
whoop de doo but you're living in filth. You're living in filth. The young boy on that, on that plane, his eyes were locked in on the prize of being able to see his daddy at that airport. I've got two, two scriptures to give you, and then we're going we're gonna to leave here. We're going to go out into the world, and we're going to live what we've been taught today. That's the goal anyway. Quickly go to 2 Corinthians 4. I'm just going to read it, and then I'm going to take you right into Philippians, and then we're going to pray. Watch what happens here. 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Watch this. Paul writes to the church, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is what church? Our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed, how often? Day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal you know I've been saying it all morning I'm gonna say it again as we get ready to close, you want to see the things that are unseen? You can only do that by the Holy Spirit. And he'll get you there if you ask him to. Go ahead and stand if you're able. And I still want you to turn while you're standing to Philippians chapter 3. And watch, watch this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture is in this chapter, Philippians chapter 3. Go home, read it for homework. It'll, it'll bless you if you study it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider myself that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything, you think otherwise God will reveal that also to you only only let us hold true to what we have attained you know Paul writes in the 12th verse he says I'm not perfect I'm not I'm not I'm not a perfect person he says in in, in, in verse 12 he says he says, but I do, I do make it this goal. I do make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You want to know why you should serve Jesus faithfully? Here it is. Because Jesus already faithfully served you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that, that we can be here today and and we can, we can look at what Paul writes to church about pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call. The truth is every one of us in this room have an upward call of God through Christ Jesus in our life. And Paul says in the 13th verse that we're to forget. We're to forget what lies behind us and we're to strain forward to what lies ahead of us. I want to encourage you, child of God, if you're here today and you're, you're fighting something from your past, take the advice of Brother Paul. Leave it behind. Those hurt feelings, let them go. Leave them behind. That hardened heart, leave it in this room when you walk out of here today. Please, God will take care of it. Leave it in this room. Don't turn around and take it with you. If there's anyone in this place that has not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you say, you know what? I understand, Pastor, that I need him to go to, go to spend eternity with God. That's the truth. He came for you, lived for you, died for you, defeated death for you, 
rose for you and he's coming back looking for you will you be ready will your house be clean will your house will your house be clean you may say pastor I'm working on that no you let God work on that you'll never get clean enough to come to Christ you come to Christ first and then Christ clean you up so if you're here today and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior you want to welcome Jesus into your life and you want the Holy Spirit of God to be deposited in your life and I welcome you to raise your hand right where you are you say pastor I need that I see you back there anybody else anybody else don't you leave here without it don't you leave here without it but that gentleman that raised his hand I'm gonna ask you to pray something right here with me Lord Jesus I am a sinner and I ask you Lord to come into my life forgive me of my sins and save my soul I recognize Lord Jesus that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven come into my heart make me a new person lead me guide me direct me Fill me with the power and the anointing from your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, as your people go forth today, I pray that you would shine upon them greatly. God, I ask that they would feel your, your tangible touch upon their lives. God, I pray that you make today easy for every one of them. That they would just truly be able to experience the lightness of burdens being taken off of their shoulders. In Jesus' name and blood. Everyone in agreement stood together. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's so worthy. He's so worthy.